start this conversation uh, with Tom Greco, who will be speaking on uh, Thursday. He'll be giving a speech. But um, I just want to have him open the conversation by talking a little bit about what, um, what are really the goals in your work? What are your goals and what have been your uh, reasons for engaging in this, in this uh, particular effort? OK. Does this work? Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Oh. OK, well, we're in deep doo-doo, as they say. You know, you've heard David Corton and Ellen Brown describe the situation with regard to money and banking. And uh, what we're up against is the greatest power in the history of the world. How do, you, how do you address a situation like that? You know, money has evolved over time. Uh, first, we had commodity money, and then we had symbolic money, which was basically warehouse receipts. When you deposit your gold in the bank, they give you a paper note. And then we had credit money. Now, credit money was a great invention because it gave us a flexible supply of exchange media. However, it also opened up the door to a lot of potential abuse. And we've had this, uh, this abusive system in place now for more than 300 years. Uh, I'll talk about this more on Thursday, but basically what we have now is credit money. The substance of money today is credit, and it's our credit. And the way I put it is that we give our, we give our credit to the banks, and then we beg them to lend some of it back to us and pay them interest for the privilege. So this is a ridiculous state of affairs, and what we have to do is reclaim the credit commons. You know, throughout uh, the last couple of days, what we've been hearing has been on that basic theme. I don't think anybody's expressed it in quite those terms, but we have to reclaim the commons all aspects of the commons. And a primary aspect of the commons is the credit commons. And in my view, self-determination requires community control of credit. You know, uh, Jane Jacobs, the noted economist, said that it's not nations that are the salient economic entities, it's cities. Cities are the salient economic entities. So we have to focus on our cities and our local communities as the economic engines. That's where the production and the, uh, the, and the business of uh, economics takes place. So what we have to do is to restore our community economies. And the way to do that is to take control of our credit. Now, even Ellen acknowledged that the political approach to reclaiming uh, our credit through the top-down national uh, level is uh, a non-starter. She wants to start um, state-level banks, and I, I think that's probably a good idea. However, I think a more direct approach to reclaiming the credit commons is by taking control of our own credit, organizing ourselves into community exchange systems, and issuing currencies based on those associated exchanges. So, I think that's a mic's not working. Here, oh, I got it. Um, so that's a great segue into um, introducing some of our other panelists, who have actually been engaging in developing new mechanisms to create credit systems um, at the grassroots level. And um, so I want to first introduce, uh, we'll go, um, we'll take maybe uh, five minutes per person just to uh, just say who you are and um, what you're working on and uh, what it, how it works. Great. And we can kind of have a conversation. <laughs> well, thanks, Chris. Yep. Um, first of all, I want to say uh, my name is Alan Rosenblith. Um, I directed The Money Fix, which is going to be playing uh, here at 530 um, on Wednesday. Um, and I want to say how incredibly uh, inspiring it is to see the money question um, being so directly addressed uh, here at this conference. I think that's a really, really positive step, because when I started the film, um, that was really fairly obscure. <laughs> um, so, but that's not really all I do. Um, 
I'm also working with a group called the Metacurrency Project. Um, and let me frame what we're doing this way. Um, among the many transformations that we're going through right now, um, one aspect of that is shifting out of the industrial age and into the information age. Um, and that's been very, very profound and large um, shift in the last 20 years or so. Um, and what we've seen with that is um, a whole suite of new business models, um, new possibilities, uh, uh, new forms of collaboration, uh, Wikipedia, for instance. Um, and there's a lot of um, uh, new, the, the way that production works in the in, in information age is very, very fundamentally different from the industrial age. So that's, that's I think, a good starting point. Um, what I think this means for the world of community currencies, um, you know, when I go around uh, and do screenings in my film and uh, do Q&As and stuff like that, it's very easy to agree, everybody to get riled up about what's wrong. I think we can agree that the current system is completely insane. Um, but then when you start making um, proposals, you know, well, we should do it this way, we should have a, a demurrage-based thing, we should have, a, a, you know, credit limits determined by X, Y, or Z, other thing, um, then nobody can agree. You have 10 people in the room, there's 15 opinions. Um, <laughs> it's, it's kind of amazing. And actually, within the com community currency world, there, it's, it's a pretty, you know, there's some pretty hefty arguments that go on. Um, some of which are kind of ideological. Um, and I think the key here, though, a meme I want to uh, introduce is that that's OK. You know, when we had uh, the idea of free speech uh, isn't that there's like the official opinion and then we're going to decide which ones we let in. Um, the free speech means, if we're committed to free speech, it means that even if we disagree on how whatever the thing that's being discussed, um, that we can come together in a higher context, um, that we each have the, the freedom to express that. And one can think of that as contributing to the idea commons. Um, in other words, that, that there's this world of ideas out there and that we all um, are free to contribute, it, contribute to it in whatever way that we want. And fundamentally, the World Wide Web has um, enabled uh, contribution to the idea commons on a scale that we've just never seen. Um, this is, if you look at, uh, the media institutions that are collapsing around our ears, newspapers, uh, record labels, and so forth. Um, that's because of this uh, completely decentralized uh, thing we call the internet. So um, one of the patterns that I think we want to look at um, when it comes to currencies is in, in the same way that we can decentralize um, access to the idea commons, uh, we can also decentralized access to the what Tom refers to as the credit commons. I might refer to it as the value commons because I actually think currency is much bigger than just credit. Um, but uh, in other words, basically, that's a very roundabout way of saying communities have the right to decide how they want to count value. And that's an inalienable, inalienable human right in every way the same as, in as much magnitude as the right to free speech is inalienable. It's just what people do we count value in ways that uh, groups of people can agree on. And that's going to be what we do. And the fact is, we do it differently from each other. Some people might want to count x, y, or z, and some other people might want to count a, b, or c. So the Metacurrency Project is really looking at bringing together these two fields. And um, quickly, I'll just say that the key to that, I think, is an open architecture. Um, which is, if you look at Wikipedia, um, the way that they gain the trust of people to actually invest hours of their time writing these articles for no pay is by saying this content is Creative Commons licensed. And anybody can mirror the server. And let's say Wikipedia, for some reason, got taken over by the international bankers um, <laughs> and started charging for their content in a heartbeat, literally before the sort of committee vote happened, there would be a new version of Wikipedia with all the same content um, that was right there. And that openness um, gives people the trust to contribute, because I wouldn't want to contribute to something that had the potential to be enclosed. I want to contribute to a truly global knowledge commons, and that's, that's what we're doing. So similarly, with the currency world, 
When we look at creating transaction networks, I think we want to look at creating open transaction networks that don't just allow one currency, but you know, what we think might be the best way to conduct a currency, which probably differs for all of us here. Um, but we want to look at creating something that allows any currency to run, and then creating the architecture so that when we do create the, the transactional infrastructure, whether it be at the point of sale, or, um, or on the web, or on our mobile devices, um, that, that that transactional architecture is open to any person or group wishing to transact in whatever way that they want to do it. So that's what the Metacurrency Project is trying to do. <laughs> cool. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. Um, so uh, the next panelist is Richard Logie, who will be uh, um, also speaking later on today. Um, but if you want to talk briefly, Richard, about what you're doing, give people an introduction. Okay. Um, as you're going to tell, I'm, I'm a foreigner. Um, that's, I'm from Scotland, and uh, we, we have a small country there, but uh, it's, a, it's a fantastic honor to have been invited here by the, the Economic of, of Peace. And uh, I come from a, a very remote part of Scotland, um, it, which is a, in, the, in the Highlands, someone known as a Highlander. And one of the things that I, that I grew up with and took with me was that um, the community really is where it happens. And um, you are who you are and what other people think you are, but also the fact that uh, your life depends on your neighbors. And when I moved to the city, and uh, I became an agricultural engineer, my, obviously a farming background, um, I got involved in the financial services industry by accident. And um, I saw lots of things that I didn't, didn't agree with, I didn't like, but uh, as fate happens, I actually got introduced to the, the barter industry and uh, how the barter industry worked. And what my background took with me was that uh, here's a, a real opportunity for creating wealth out of unused or, un, uh, or what we call the unsold. The, the way that the barter industry or the commercial barter industry works, and I've been running a commercial exchange system or a mutual peer-to-peer -peer system or a barter system, depends what label you want to put on it, since 1995. Uh, and I've been being involved with a fantastic organization called IRTA, which is the International Reciprocal Trade Association, who actually just celebrated the 30th anniversary this year. And they, in a lot of cases, the people who are involved with the International Reciprocal Trade Association call themselves barter companies. And I don't think they really realize the significance of what they really are about. And the way that uh, I, things have evolved for myself over the last uh, 15 years is I've been like a sponge for you know, taking lots and lots of in information. And of course, with my, my engineering background, uh, I started putting together uh, this picture in my head on how things should be built, almost like a, an architect would. Um, but also, all good architects, they always listen to their customers. Because we, there's in this room, and the people I've met over the years, there are some fantastic, unbelievable minds. But sometimes they forget who the customer is. And the, one of the tests I tell people when I hear them talking about their currency, I said, well, the first thing you should do is to go out in the street and ask the first person you speak and say, well, what do you think of this currency system? And if they give you a blank look, then go back and redesign it. So um, one of the things that uh, we, we've been doing over the last few years is listening to the customers. You know, what do you want? How do you want it? Uh, looking at comparison uh, uh, organizations that have gone through the same process. And what, what I uh, am saying just now is even though the, the, the economic climate is in, in crisis, so is the complementary currency industry in crisis. Because really, you know, the, a lot of the, the philosophies are saying, oh, complementary currencies or barter systems should flourish when the economy is on a downturn. Well, I'm actually not seeing that. I'm on the inside. Um, I'm listening to a uh, barter company owners um, you know, from around the world who are saying that this is just as dangerous a time for them than it is for the, the, the commercial bank systems. Understanding how we can learn is uh, one of the, uh, an, an organization called the uh, European Union. Now, if you know anything about Europe, um, they've been at wars for you know, thousands of years, millions have died. They've all been fighting for their own patch, they've been competing, border disputes. And over the last 60 years, they stopped fighting. 
and they started cooperating and they started to agree in, on terms and conditions. They're, they're still awkward. The, nobody likes the French and nobody likes the, nobody likes the French. And, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but you've got to love them. They, they, they do the thing with the French. It's the best thing about the French is the government are scared of the people. All right? And <laughs> not the other way around. So I love the French. But uh, you know, the, 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 what they put together is lessons for us to learn. And also another organization that uh, you know, springs to mind, which is this big, well-known uh, organization, which I'm pretty sure you all touch every day. I'm sure they touch your life every day. It's a company called Visa. How many people have got Visa cards in their pockets here? Yeah, quite a few people. And what they did, again, out of a crisis with the credit card industry, if you look back to the, the 50s and the 60s, it was, in, it was dying. It was going nowhere. It's a great idea. It, was, it had huge um, potential, but for some reason, they just could not get it, get it together. And then through the genius of Hawk, he decided, look, cooperation. And if it wasn't because of the crisis, people like Bank of America would never have looked at it because they knew it was dying. It was, it was taking a, a dip that you know, the, 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 the whole visa concept was through cooperation standards, procedures, and making sure that we all agree on how we're going to go forward. The same thing with the complementary currency industry. And I'm talking about the commercial side of the, the complementary currency industry and the non-commercial. They both have the same problems. They both have the same bad habits. They've got the same abuse systems. Is that we can then use an, a, a simple cooperation and standards and procedures to um, to get the to unite the industry. So well, this is what I've been working on in the last four years, and I've been speaking to some very um, well um, educated people from both sides. And I'm talking about educated. I'm talking about people from experience. Um, you know, you can read books to the cows come home. That's an old Scottish saying. You know, that's a long time. And uh, sometimes they don't come home. Um, so, uh, <laughs> but you can't beat experience, you know. And uh, one of the things I did to when I did my presentation, which I'm really giving away a little bit of the joke here. You know, as an engineer or as an architect. You take a little bit from column A and a little bit from column B and you come together with a new product. And okay, it's, a, and it's an evolve, evolved product. It's not a revolution. It's an evolved product. And one of the things that I think is very, very important is that we don't go through a revolution. We go through an evolution. And they, that we don't go through an alternative. We go through a complementary. Maybe I'm saying that the wrong word. Maybe we should go complementary, not alternative. And we should have co a cooperation rather than competition. And through that thought process, we then decide that the, the, the community is the currency. The actual community is the currency. So we've got to design the next version of our currency system, which we class as money 3.0. And uh, it, it's, you know, if you, as we know, we've had money 1.0. It has a, a great ability of, of portable wealth, you know, gold and silver. We're now in the middle of money 2.0, which is centrally controlled. Now we can run to money 3.0, which is peer-to-peer -peer credit systems. But run under good governance, good rules, good systems, good procedures, so that gives the integrity to the currency. And it's not a case of, you know, um, you know uh, giving people credit that aren't credit worthy. You, you're also putting in reputation systems to make people accountable for their actions and their, their currency system. So all these processes we, we pull together and over this four year period we've now designed technology that allows us to have multiple systems, different technologies to inter interact with each other but also to measure the currency system that's in, in the system. You've got to measure currency flow, velocity, money supply, all these things that the bankers do. So you've got to think like the bankers, but you also got to think local as well. So what we've been doing over the last few years is, and today, actually this, this uh, uh, event is really the launch of the whole program, and uh, it's called GETS, which is uh, a word that can be used in multiple uh, languages, but also in multiple um, uh, uh, phrases. So that uh, what we're trying to do here is saying to the people, let's get with it, let's get local currency, and let's get let's get moving. So, cool. uh, Richard Logie, thank you very much. Thank you, Richard. Um, um, so the the next speaker is um, actually local to Sonoma and. Um, uh, Derek Huntington is uh, running, putting together a, a local currency here in uh, in Sonoma, 
and de basically developing his own technology as well. Um, and uh, I've, yeah, well, I'll just let you <laughs> talk a little bit. Yeah, and, and let, me, let me just uh, specify, I'm not a Sonoman because the city of Sonoma has its very own solid identity out here. Um, I'm a Santa Rosan, which is part of Santa Sonoma Rosa. County, so I just wanted to oh, differentiate I'm that. I'm so sorry. But no, no worries. We, we love <laughs> Sonomans and Santa Rosa. We get along well. Um, <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, um, and actually turning a profit in those programs and so realizing how, you know, the the, the uh, different difference between nonprofits and for profits can sometimes be, uh, you know, non existent. But um, also, um, I, I am a trained in corporate finance, um, you know, basically how to uh, obtain and allocate resources inside of companies. Um, I also have a social science background in international politics and globalization. Um, and, and uh, you know, have, so I can kind of see it from both sides. And I'm a licensed investment professional as well. And so, you know, I, I work with people who, um, you know, are trying to, you know, take the money that they've uh, earned over the course of their lives and, you know, just try to live off of it for the rest of their life and, and also do so, um, you know, in a way that, that, that matches their values. And, and in a lot of cases, um, for people, they don't always see the connection or, you know, they're purposely made opaque. Um, you now I come at, come at, came at this uh, whole process and was introduced to the uh, Bali concept in, in 2006, and I've been working on that in Sonoma County since then. Um, and, and this was a, a beautiful aha moment for me because I was banging my head against uh, the whole socially responsible investment industry. And you know, recent re research had been done back then by Paul Hawken, Natural Capital Institute, on you know, you could look at the, the universe of socially responsible investments and only not find two companies in the S&P 500 in one of those funds or another. And it's like, okay, is this really socially responsible? You know, how do we move this in the, the right direction? And the idea of local living economies snapped in my head and, and that was it. That was it. Um, since then, I really was focusing on, on local investment structures, how to get local money into local enterprises to really build local living economies. But um, I had a... Uh, a friend and partner of mine, um, you know, Philip Beard, constantly just saying, look at the money, look at the money, look at the money, you know, as, as part of it, you know, you can't, even if you get local investment, it's still based on this interest burden, uh, debt-based money system that Ellen so, um, you know, effectively, uh, you know, talked about today. Um, so we, we spent a few years, um, you know, mainly Philip and I, but also others involved with, with, uh, with Go Local, um, looking at this and, and how do we address these issues in a kind of a comprehensive uh, systemic fashion, um, you know, addressing all of the credit and capital needs of a community to, you know, create a system that can actually kind of, you know, not replace but complement and support, um, you know, what's going on in the local economy. So, um, you know, I, I'm pleased to be up here. I mean, I don't know if I deserve to be here yet because we're still, we're still working on getting it all in place. But, you know, I'm standing on the shoulder of giants and a couple of them, uh, you know, are, are sitting here. A few of them are sitting on this panel right now. Um, um, so, I mean, what, what we're doing a little bit differently than some of the other systems is, uh, you know, we're trying to really look at it from a full systems perspective. And I, and I wouldn't say that everybody isn't, but um, the way, the approach we've taken is, is looking at, um, you know, expanding on the beautiful work that's been done in the business-to-business -business commercial trade and barter by finding ways to engage, you know, com the full community members, you know, business con to consumer and creating that, that full circle connection as well as uh, how do you integrate that and, and, and make it work in a, in a, in with also the investment and uh, savings structures which are important uh, to, to building economies and, 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 you know, make it easy and accessible for, for people um, and engage them where they're at. Um, and, and have also been looking at, you know, it's not just how you do it, um, but it's also why you do it. So, you know, the how is, you know, how is the credit issued? How does the money make it into the businesses? But also, why are we making these decisions in the first place? Um, you know, in trying to infuse values and quality of life and well-being back into the discussion and back into uh, people's decision making when they're going to decide where they bank, where they shop, where they invest, and where they, where they give. Um, and, and uh, you know, so we've taken this whole big thing and try, been trying to tackle it. And, uh, you know, we really see, um, you know, the, the Bali networks, the relocalization networks, these innovative groups of people who have this new vision of local living economies as, as the way and the conduit for, for doing this and, and the network of networks approach. Um, so, you know, our, our plan and, and what we're working on here in Sonoma County is, is doing it here. 
And, uh, you know, Richard is, is totally right. You know, we see this, this problem over here of the money system, and we're like, okay, we're going to create a solution for that problem, but we can't just try to impose that solution on people um, in communities and, and, uh, and in businesses, and it has to work for everybody. So it's really important that you're engaged with the community and on the ground saying, what do you need? How can this support you? And then really making sure you're tailoring what you're doing, not only to try to solve these, these problems, which are huge, but also you know, really supporting right now the well-being and the success of our local businesses, our local economies, and our communities. Um, so, yeah, that's cool. Yeah, I just, I just really want to acknowledge all you guys for the amount of work and passion that you've been, been putting into this. And um, uh, I mean, all the people here have been incredibly dedicated and passionate around um, really trying to develop a new architecture from the bottom up um, that really creates a, a truly democratic form of exchange. Um, so I am uh, I'm a little wary of time. Um, I think I probably, I, know I need to make a couple announcements and then I think we should probably um, convene. Um, this conversation is going to be uh, continuing throughout the conference, and I know I just I also want to acknowledge that there is an incredible amount of genius in the audience as well, and um, um, people who have not been able to uh, get included in the schedule. And um, so we are going to try to make space available for people to spontaneously come together and have. Um, open workshops around projects that they're involved in or to just mingle and um, exchange ideas. Um, so uh, tonight is going to be a, um, an opportunity to, um, for people who are interested in this to um, convene um, over at the community center at 5.30. There's gonna be a couple people who are gonna be hosting uh, spontaneous open um, workshops and presentations there. Um, and uh, um, so Alex Gordon Brander will be uh, giving a uh, talk and presentation there as well as Eric Rothenberg. Um, and let's see, oh, Alan's, of course, Alan's movie is gonna be playing tomorrow, uh, tomorrow night at five o'clock? 5.30. 5.30. Ah. Um, and uh, um, and then Richard, both Richard and Derek will be giving um, workshops uh, tomorrow, today. Well, today and right today. And then work, Richard, you're giving one more workshop on Thursday. So um, let's see. Should we? Uh, you want to give one one last comment? For uh, yeah. Oh. We could also questions with Ellen right right now. Um, hmm. Could I just say wanna, okay, sure. Uh, I'd just like to make one more point to try to clear up some confusion. Uh, the use of the word money, uh, we're sometimes kind of careless in how we use it, and money has different meanings. And I want to make the distinction between exchange credit and finance credit. And uh, I have a, a little chart in my newest book, The End of Money and the Future of Civilization, where I make that distinction. You know, what we're talking about with money is exchange credit. Uh, the medium of exchange is the primary function of money. And that's what we're talking about when we're talking about local exchanges and local currencies. The finance function is something entirely different. Uh, that's the question of how do we finance the development of new capital infrastructure. And so that should be, uh, that should be done by uh, long-term credit uh, that comes out of our savings Actually, rather than uh, short-term credit, which serves as the medium of exchange. 